Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, highlights from the annual Defense News Conference. Top officials and experts from military and industry dig into some of the most pressing topics of today. And an extensive look back on the September 11, 2001 attacks as seen through the eyes of veterans. Plus, a conversation with a veteran who organized a daring mission to evacuate Afghans out of Kabul, Afghanistan. There's a lot to get to this week, covering the latest from the Pentagon to the platoon. This is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. The annual Defense News Conference is a gathering of some of the top leaders and officials in the military and defense industry spaces. This year's event focused on the changing landscape of the world order amid great power competition and what it means for U.S. and international interests. Up first, comments from Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks, who spoke about a range of topics with Defense News' Marjorie Sensor. Thank you so much, Dr. Hicks. As you well know, the, the budget is an obvious uh, demonstration of, of priorities. Will the next budget um, you know, put a greater emphasis on climate change? Will we see that, that uh, a different level of spending than we've seen in the past? We are definitely looking at, at that both in our strategy development efforts and in the FY23 to 27 Palm review process. Uh, so we do anticipate that you would see very clearly tagged out in the FY23 budget displays. You'd be able to track much better than the department has in the past what it's spending on climate. And yes, I am putting a special emphasis in the program review process on making sure we are making the most that we can of our access to commercial um, solutions and that we are making that those business case decisions where it's in support of the warfighter. These are not um, uh, ideological issues of climate versus warfighting. This is about ensuring we are resilient and capable for the warfighter of the future and we'll be making those investments. What do you think is the role of um, defense contractors here? Obviously, you're mentioning these commercial solutions, but is there going to be... Um, you know, some increased expectations of contractors when it comes to um, their role in, in addressing climate change? There are some um, executive order implications already out. Um, I would anticipate there will be more both regulatory, meaning, you know, coming through statute. Um, certainly at the state level, we see plenty of that. And then again, there may be more executive actions that um, have implications for uh, our, our contractors. Some of that we're already in discussions on federal register level um, uh, discussions of, uh, with the our contract with our DIB partners on what the implications may be for them. And we work closely with the White House where, you know, we obviously uh, believe that, as I said before, being climate forward, uh, climate change, you know, forward also helps our warfighters. But there are also real cases where we're going to have to protect that innovation base and there may be some trade-offs there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hicks. I appreciate the time. Up next, the top leaders from the Army talk about emerging priorities in the developing era of conflict around the globe. Defense News' Jen Judson spoke with the Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth, and Army Chief of Staff, General James McConville. You know, what is the withdrawal from Afghanistan's impact on Army readiness? Well, Jen, uh, we've been very careful to make sure that we manage our ability to maintain our readiness, even as we provide all of the support to the safe havens as part of Operation Allies Welcome. So I'm, I'm happy to report that we're not going to see a negative impact on readiness. Uh, we are working to make sure that we are rotating the troops that are supporting the different uh, safe havens at the various installations around the country. And we're confident we're going to be able to manage this even as we, of course, work closely with DHS as the lead federal agency to make sure that, um, that the, the mission doesn't continue on for a very long period of time. 
Yeah, and if I could add, Jen, just for, for our soldiers uh, that may be watching this, just, you know, it, it, what happened over the last couple of weeks has been very uh, trying for a, a lot of our soldiers. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we went to Afghanistan to hold Osama bin Laden accountable, along with to make sure that Al-Qaeda uh, could never uh, have a major attack on the homeland. And uh, our soldiers, uh, with their heroism, act actually did that. And so those who served, uh, they did their job. They did their job extremely well. Uh, they should be very, very proud of their service because we are too. Thank you, General McConville and Secretary Warmoth for joining us. When we come back, on the eve of the 20th anniversary of the attacks, a look back at several veterans' experiences on September 11th, 2001. Welcome back. September 11th, 2001 was a world-changing event for millions of people. As the eve of the 20th anniversary approached, we spoke to a number of veterans about their experiences around the attacks. Here's some of what they had to say. I just said, Ethan, can I help you? Yes, hi, oh. good morning. This is New York Military calling at New York Center. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, our uh, watch supervisor needs a number for a possible hijacking. Uh, he wants to call somebody in case they need some assistance with, with your uh, fighter jets. Hunter's weapon, Sergeant Powell. Hi, right, Boston Center, Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. We have some claims. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We're returning to the airport. Uh, latest report, aircraft via fly six miles southeast of the White House. Oh, the hijackers are in the cockpit. Oh, oh no. You need to read this. Region commander has declared that we can shoot down tracks that do not respond to our uh, direction. Okay. I'll pass out the weapon. Hey, okay. You read that from the vice president, right? Vice president has cleared. It was just an absolute beautiful morning. Um, it was kind of the first morning where the temperature had broken and the first, it was starting to feel like fall. I came out of the train and there was, um, uh, the, the tower one had already been hit, uh, but really and truly, I didn't even, um, I didn't, I, I was so kind of in my own world. I didn't really notice everyone around me, you know, doing, you know, looking up kind of. I had, um, just joined my fighter squadron as one of the very junior um, backseat uh, weapon systems officers in the F-18 community. That's a fighter jet that has air-to-air -air missiles and bombs. Next thing I know, I get a phone call from the base, from my um, operations officer, my executive officer, can't even remember which one, um, called uh, me and said, get in to the ready room, get into the base immediately, and um, you'll get further word from there, but you need to get in now. My, my specific workplace was in the, what, what we call the STO, uh, Special Technical Operations. And, uh, you know, that's where we have like this highly secure, super secret. Well, it's probably, it was the, it's the most secure area in the entire, <laughs> you know, it was where we had all our, uh, you know, high end stuff there, the highest end, right? So, you know, a little bit after nine, um, yeah, is when they started to get news reports about the, the aircraft and they started to show stuff about it. And so that's when that, that kind of caught our attention. And we went immediately to, to Force Protection Condition Delta. Um, the, the entire military shut down, like our, the entire military base is shut down all over the country. Every unit that could got out, um, and, but in Great Lakes, we just couldn't leave. So we were on lockdown for a couple of days and it eventually alleviated, but it was, I mean, it was a scary time. And I'll tell you, I'll never forget sitting in that break room, watching all these things happen and kind of just like, like knowing that this is a big deal, the USS coal bombing had just happened. So we thought like, maybe it'll be kind of like that. But by the end of the day, we knew that the world had changed forever.
because I lived so close, I was able to be one of the first ones on. The gates kind of shut after I got onto the base. So I got into the ready room and my commanding officer or executive officer sort of looked around and there weren't a whole lot of us to man the jets. And I remember sort of getting the nod, but it was a reluctant nod from my superiors because I was so junior. And they were like, well, we're gonna have to put you in the cockpit, McGrath. And they did. I uh, went out to the combined arms loading area on the other side of the base and hopped into a fully loaded with air to air missiles, um, sidewinders and AMRAMs, radar and heat seeking guided, uh, heat seeking uh, missiles into an F-18. I was just north of um, of the South Tower, kind of like right in between them, kind of the way they were. And uh, and I heard this lady, this this lady yell, you know, oh my God, there's another one. So as it hit the the like exit hole of the second tower was right above me when the second plane hit uh, Tower Two, the exit hole fireball, I. I felt it like on my face. Like it was like one of the, like the heat was just so extreme. It was um, really, really, really can't describe it. I think that was the time for a lot of us that the whole thing became really, really, really real for us. You know, of course we'd shown up and seen the disaster from the outside, but once you walked into those hallways in complete darkness, um, you know, with a couple of fires still burning in a couple of different locations. And it just, you know, it's like, it was like something out of a movie, something out, out of an absolute nightmare. That's where things kind of, I don't want to say went downhill, but that's where things kind of went from you know, moving stuff around to finding remains um, and assisting with remains recovery. You know, we, we would, uh, we would try to, if we located something, um, and more often than not, it was, it was just, it was a piece. Uh, I, I won't mince words about it at all. It was a piece. There were in our area and I, I kind of, I think we were very fortunate in my, my company specifically, uh, my platoon specifically, really. Um, we were fortunate because we were very close to the actual impact area and on the ground floor where the, most of what you were dealing with, you knew it was a human. You knew that it had been human at one point. Um, but you could dis disassociate yourself from what it was because, you know, it was, it was a foot, it was a hand, you know, it was something of that nature. For the next three and a half to four hours, we sat on that runway with live weapons ready to launch um, to defend the West Coast of the United States. And our orders would have been to shoot down any um, commercial aircraft coming in who was not following the orders. I remember being in the cockpit and just part of me thinking, oh my gosh, what, what am I about to do here? Um, what is my country asking me to do? And the other part of me thinking, I'm trained, I'm here, this is what I signed up for. And if my country needs me to, to do this, I'm, I've got to do it. Lots of, lots of screaming, lots of yelling and whatever. And the whole thing was just get people away. So people are pouring out of the buildings, uh, but it's bad. I mean, it's, there's stuff, um, stuff is pouring out of the buildings. The buildings are, are billowing smoke. Uh, people started to jump, which was terrible. Uh, some firefighter dude was like, it's going, it's going, it's going. And everyone just started to run. There's a wall of stuff chasing us up, uh, chase, chasing everybody up whatever direction you were going in. And um, uh, truly, there's, there are no words to describe it. You really can't. Um, I've seen video, people have taken videos, you know, found videos and stuff and camera footage and everything else, and none of it does it justice. None of it. Uh, 
and um, I was uh, I was truly um, uh, I remember thinking I'm gonna die, and I remember thinking I I hope that I'm found, and and I hope it's not too painful. So I headed back down, and then it was same song, different verse, and uh, Tower One came screaming down. Um, uh, uh, I don't really remember much of it, to be frank. Um, I just remember um, not really believing, like, here we go again. Like, so unbelievably scared because I had already done this once. And round one was unsurvivable. And like, there's, you know, there's no way. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Like, I'm, I've, I've, I've used all, my, all nine of my lives in the last half hour. For us, you know, we, we, I, I think the hardest part for me, because I've always been, you know, kind of fatherly, I guess, uh, even before I had kids, um, was finding things that you knew were uh, children's items, you know, backpacks. Uh, it was odd. It was weird how fireworks, and, you know, you would, in one section, you'd have what was clearly the, the skin of the aircraft melted down to absolutely nothing. And then you would find 10 feet away from it, a child's backpack that had a couple of burn marks on it. Um, you have, and you know, we would find places where you could find the seat from the actual aircraft it was mostly intact and it was burned, all the fabric was burned off of it. But you could tell it was a seat off a plane. And just all around, it's nothing but absolute destruction. But here's this piece that survived. For more on that story, head to militarytimes.com with full coverage by reporter Sarah Sicard. When we come back, Jeanette Mack from Navy Federal Credit Union gives her latest personal finance tips. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you her latest tips. According to recent data from Zillow, 78% of homeowners considered refinancing their mortgage last year, while only 22% actually did. The difference between thinking about it and actually doing it is knowing if and when to refi. The best place to start is at home. How long are you going to be there? If you're moving in a few years, a refi could cost you more, even with a lower monthly payment. And about that payment, it's the number one reason most people refi, to lower their interest rate and thereby their monthly payment. If mortgage rates are lower than yours by 1% or more, it's probably good to refi. But will you actually save money? It depends on your break-even point or the point when closing costs and fees are paid for by what you'll save with your new monthly payment. Use an online refi calculator to get an accurate number. And finally, refinancing is great if you want to tap equity for cash toward home improvements or debt consolidation. With a VA loan, the guide is basically the same except you must pass a 210-day waiting period between your current mortgage and the date you close on your new one. Always go with a lender who specializes in VA, whether it's for a new mortgage or refinancing. They'll know the ins and outs for a smoother process. Your lender can also help you understand all the costs and benefits, so go with one you trust to help you decide if and when to refi. The time might be now. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to be the most up-to-date in your unit, get a list of our top stories in your email each weekday with our early bird brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, another look into the desperate effort to get vulnerable Afghans out of Kabul, Afghanistan. Welcome back. Amid the frantic efforts to get vulnerable Afghans and their families out of Kabul, Afghanistan in the final days of U.S. presence, one veteran headed up a special effort. Dubbed the Pineapple Express, the effort aimed to extract Afghans at the height of the evacuation. Here's more of that story. The operation has been dubbed uh, Operation Pineapple, Task Force Pineapple, uh, the Pineapple Express. 
um, all names that were kind of given to it, it, it really is an organic, informal movement. I mean, it was not a formal operation. It was not planned. It was, a, it started with the, with the, with the assistance provided uh, to one Afghan commando named Nizam who was a friend of mine. Uh, I had worked with him in 2010 and had mentored him for many, many years. He was also a friend of James Meek from ABC News, several other Green Berets. Um, and when it became clear that his special immigration visa that he'd applied for for two years was not gonna get passed, you know, even though it had been accepted and it was in deputy chief of mission categories, um, it wasn't gonna get improved in time as Kabul fell that's when I, I just thought, man, you know, we've got to do some kind of reasonable action here to honor this promise and prevent what we knew, what I knew was going to be either imminent execution or serious injury. And so, you know, I called up James, I called up Congressman Waltz's office because I wanted, I wanted some reach. And then I called up the couple of Green Berets that are still on active duty, and I'll leave them out of this. And we decided to get on the phone with Nizam. Uh, use an encrypted, you know, downloadable app and uh, be his eyes and ears to try to get him to the airfield because the calls were going out to go to the airfield from State Department, but there was no way for him to get there. He was Uzbek, he spoke Dari, he didn't know the city, and, you know, there were all these checkpoints. So we leveraged our relationships of by, with, and through and uh, facilitated his movement through the city, got him close to the airfield, and then uh, made phone calls to folks inside that could, that helped open the gate for him. And because they knew that I mean, he's a vetted partner. I mean, he is uh, there's a risk for execution and there's a risk to national security if he's compromised. Right. Because of the knowledge he has of special forces and special operators. So they got it. But they just it was how do you recognize him in you know, this throng of people? And that's when they said, have him yell out pineapple. <laughs> so we said to him, say pineapple. And he did, and that's how he got pulled through. And that became the Pineapple Express, Task Force Pineapple. And then we just started using that technique of being a shepherd on the phone uh, to other partners. And these were Navy SEALs, Army Rangers that were coming to us going, how did you guys do that? And we just shared our techniques and we opened the room up, became more collaborative. And before long, a, a citizen liaison network was formed. Nizam said to me, he said, um, he said, sir, and he said this to James Meek, too. He said, I'm, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to die alone. And for so many of us veterans, you know, that's like, that's like the worst thing in the world, man, is, is you don't leave anybody behind. You don't do that. And so how do we honor that promise? We stay on the phone with them, and we're their eyes and ears. And, and that's what we did. And there were people on the inside who, who helped us gain entry. Um, and we got 700 through in three days that made it that made it to freedom. These people were out there for days in the hot Afghan sun with no food, no water. They were defecating and urinating right there in the open. There were no bathrooms. You had women, the, the wife of an Afghan special forces officer who went to our qualification course, went into labor at the gate itself and got separated from her husband and uh it was it was it was terrible children were trampled um people were shot by the taliban while waiting there and this was well before the isis explosion happened and you know and you had throngs of people who just wanted out of the country that had not applied for p1 p2 siv and then you had people who had applied and who were by all definitions made a promise to come in and, and that was where we intended to provide those, because they're going to be executed, right? They are going to be tracked and hunted. They are, they are, they are on a watch list with the Taliban. They have the Tash kills, the biometric data. And so our, our goal was to try to get them recognized and pulled in in a safe and efficient way. That Abbey Gate explosion, when that happened, and we lost people in that explosion because they could not go any further, um, there were other gates open, but they just, they couldn't. They had uh, elderly with them, they had children with them, and they just sat at the gate. We couldn't, we couldn't get them to move. And um, we never heard from them again.
and we we learned later that that many many people were killed from from you know the families of Afghan special operations forces who had just chosen to stay there. Um, it was it was catastrophic, and I knew as soon as that bomb went off, that was it. There were no more you know there was not going to be any more entries into the airfield. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.